And please take your Bibles again and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. If you're using one of the Bibles in the chairs, it's page 975. We're going to be just unpacking chapter, uh, verses 4 to 11 in Hebrews 12. I'm going to read from verses 1 uh, to the end of verse 11, and then uh, want to spend a few moments in prayer uh, before we dig into God's Word. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning of verse 1, we're listening to the Word of the Lord. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood? And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as His children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Would you please join me in prayer? Father, we, uh, we do want to express thanksgiving and, and praise, adoration. We want to honor you in this moment. You have blessed us already uh, in this day, in these moments together. Um, we thank you, Father, for the way you use uh, these means of grace, your word and prayer, and even these emblems, these times around the table. Uh, Father, you use the voices, the lives, even being together, Father. We undervalue that. The reality is that this is a treasure moment when we are met together in Jesus' name. And we together experience your presence and your work by the Spirit in ways that we will not experience it alone. So thank you, Father, for the means of grace that are my family here in Port Perry Baptist Church. And we want to praise you because we have we've been reflecting on your love for us too briefly. It's been too small. But Father, we... We are grateful we can, that we can even know you and love you, that we can have any assurance at all that you would receive us in prayer and in relationship, Father. All of this is only possible because you crucified your Son and you poured out your just condemnation for my sin on Jesus so that I could pray so that I could know you, so that I could walk with you and love you and know the comfort and joy of your presence in my life. That's, Father, true of us as your people. Give us hearts of thanksgiving and praise. Father, we confess as well that there are so many things and our, our opportunity was too small. We need to unburden our hearts in confession when we come to these moments together around your table the sin that sticks to us, the sin that we neg- either we don't notice or we don't want to notice, the, the things that just aren't right, the things that tangle our feet as we seek to run after Jesus. 
Now, Father, would you do, deal with each heart in this place and begin with mine and bring conviction, bring repentance, bring transformation. Father, we pray believing that because Jesus died and rose again, when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and you forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we also want to plead with you for your help. We don't really understand how badly we need you in every moment, in every breath. Our very existence rests in your sovereign, gracious hands. You do put us in moments that remind us, that show us, Father, how much we need you. And so we pray. And you've called us to cast our cares our burdens, our fears, our anxieties, all these things upon you because you care for us. So, Father, I pray again today for the grieving, not just the recently grieved. Father, uh, another loss brings memories of other losses, and even this season of the year brings back to memory times and people who are no longer with us. And suddenly things that we thought we had healed from the wound seems open again. So meet with your people with comfort and peace. Father, I pray for those who are hurting today, whether that hurt is physical, and we do have a long list. I think again of Joan today in hospital recovering. Martin, we praise you that he's He's coming home from the hospital, but Father, what a journey of recovery physically and the spiritual battles that come with that for him and for Tina, and for Sandy and her recovery from heart issues, and our list goes on and on. Father, for those who are hurting physically, but more than this, Father, for those who are hurting in relationships and with emotions where there is stress and strain, where there is bitterness and frustration, where there is unforgiveness, where there is brokenness in hearts and in homes. Oh, Father, I pray for those who are simply hurting today because of relationships that aren't what they should be. I pray, Father, that you would call your children closer into fellowship with their heavenly Father. And as you bring them comfort and hope, Use that healing work to make them instruments, ministers of grace and peace that relationships might be restored. For I, Father, I pray this morning for the fearful and the anxious, and maybe that I'm just praying for all of us now. Whatever it is, there are things in our lives close to home and far away that make us fearful and anxious. We're afraid of losing things, our way of life, or we're afraid of not having enough retirement and otherwise. We're afraid, Father, of what diagnosis we might get should we visit the doctor this week. Oh, Father, we are riddled with fear and anxieties, and it ought not to be so. You have not given us a spirit of fear or timidity. Oh, Father, would you meet with us, again, even through these times of worship around the table, help us to trust you, to truly empty our hands and our hearts of these things that we fret over and to see in you your perfect answer, even when we don't know what that answer is. You've promised, Father, that there's, there's nothing going to slip between your fingers. Oh, we pray for your peace. Father, however it is, hearts in this place and in our family, whether they're here today or not, hearts that are troubled or discouraged, hurting or grieving, confused, fearful, anxious, wayward and disobedient. We are quite the flock of sheep. I thank you, Good Shepherd, that you love to guide your sheep into green pastures and by still waters. That even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't need to be afraid because you are right there with us. And that, Father, your love and grace in Christ, it will, it will track with us through all of our days. And you have promised that because of Jesus, 
we will dwell with you forever. So, Father, would you instruct, comfort, encourage, rebuke, teach, train, grow, feed your sheep now. It's your word by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Discipline. There's a happy topic. Discipline. Whether you're a child with human parents or you are a child of God, the question of discipline can be a little bit difficult. But let me, let me ask you this question. And by the way, I, I, I do have a clock on my iPad. I know it is already 1130. If you didn't know that, I'm alerting you to that fact. So you're going to get a, a bit of a Coles Notes version of the message today, but I want to hit the high points for you on this vital area of faith and faithfulness for us as we look to follow Jesus all the way home. So here's the question I want to ask, and true or false? God loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. True or false? True. true. Most everybody true. Any falses out there? Now, I want to say true, and by the time we get to the end of the message, I think you'll see why I can say true. But... If we're going to use that kind of terminology in our communication with one another as God's people, we better be careful to understand our definitions. Certainly God's love, and we've touched on that definitionally today, what does it mean for God to love us? God loves us so much, He sent His Son to die for us so that we could be rescued from our rebellion and sin, the judgment against us, and have life with Him forever. He's He sent His Son to rescue us from that, to transform us, to make us into the people He always meant us to be. And if you're not a Christian, I want you to consider that. You think you're fine. And maybe fearful that, oh, this trusting in Jesus is going to mess with my life. Listen, I want to encourage you. This is biblical language, but I'll use it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is the good shepherd. And He does not leave us in sin and in darkness. He pulls us out of that. Oh, yes, it's important to understand the definition of God's love. God doesn't love us and leave us where we are. He loves us and rescues us. We also want to be careful in our definition of uh, His wonderful plan for your life. Most, our, the most common assumption... Uh, almost our default assumption is this, as human beings, even redeemed people. If God loves me, He will be working very hard to keep me safe and comfortable, to keep bad things from happening to me. Yes, in we've touched on passages already this morning that God desires to give us peace. He doesn't want us to live with fear and anxiety. He he died, He gave His Son and rescues us from sin so that we might experience peace and contentment and comfort and all sorts of gloriously good things. And yet, you're chuckling because you understand there's there's a disconnect here, right? Listen, if we are going to persevere, endure in faith and faithfulness, we need to be clear on how it is Hard things in this life are used of God. Really, God weaves hard things into the fabric of our lives as His redeemed people, as part of His wonderful purpose. The hard things. Failure to see and understand how it is God disciplines us between here and home, heaven, Failure to see and understand this can lead us to disaster, spiritually speaking. It sets us up for great disappointment and failure. So we turn for a moment to Hebrews 12, verses 4 to 11. The writer's concern, as we've noted throughout our study, is for a people who have professed faith in Jesus, who he says, in other spots he says, I believe that you do know and love and trust in Jesus. You're following him. But there are pressures and threats against them that might cause their knees to buckle, 
might make them want to turn away from Christ and go back to their Jewish heritage. Those hard things now are going to be seen not so much as obstacles to be overcome as gifts to be received. Does that make sense? That God, in His love and His wisdom for you, has ordained hard and painful things. This is His wonderful plan for your life. Let me make three observations of the passage I read, verses 4 to 11. First, if we're going to see and understand how it is God wisely, lovingly uses hard things to discipline us, we have to recognize what the writer here means by our struggle against sin. What does he mean in verse 4 when he says, In your struggle against sin you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He's not talking about our ongoing battle with sin and temptation, however temptation might come to us, greed, uh, lust, uh, resentment, bitterness, all the ways we are tempted to sin against God. That is a battle, and we need to fight that battle. We need to overcome te- those temptations and resist sinful temptation as it comes to us. That's true, but that's not what he's talking about here. If you notice back in verse number 3, he refers to the Lord Jesus as the example we follow. And he says there, "...consider him who endured such opposition from sinners." And then in verse 4, he says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And then he's going to go on to discuss how God is using hard things to discipline them, to grow them up in the Lord. The the point, I think, is this. And it can be taken, I think, uh, two ways together. Let me put it to you that way. He's talking about a struggle with sin, which is bound up with the opposition from an unbelieving world, specific people or cultural things, that there's opposition, like Jesus faced opposition that ultimately led to His crucifixion. So consider Him who endured the opposition of sinners in your struggle against sin, the reality of living as His people in a sinful world. We are, we are living in opposition to the darkness. And so there's, in this, Struggle against sin is that idea of struggling against the world that is opposed to us and the threats that come from those who don't like what it is we believe and how it is we live. Secondly, and I would say alongside this, some have made this an either or, I think it's a both and, there is a struggle with temptation here, but the temptation is to give up. That's been the temptation he's been zeroed in on through the whole study. The pressures are coming, whatever those pressures are, threats. Earlier on, the writer talks about them losing losing property, giving up property. Somebody's coming along and taking their property because they're Christians, and they've joyfully suffered in that way. Whatever the opposition or the threat, there is a temptation inherent in that that we might give in. So in overly maybe overly dramatic and simplistic all at the same time, someone puts a gun to your head and says, you renounce Jesus or I will blow your brains out. What do you do? Now, all of us in this moment want to say, well, I would tell him that you go ahead and pull the trigger. (laughs) Put yourself in the moment, though. Let me make this a little more painful for you. Every time... You give in to sinful temptation. You are walking away from the gun. You're giving in. You're going, the sin, I value the sin more than I value faithfulness to Jesus. That's, that's the tension in that picture, right? If you be faithful to Jesus, I will kill you. Sin says to us, in every kind of sin, in every moment of sin, says to us, You be faithful to me and give up Jesus or I will kill you. And so we give in. So, 
not to, again, I'm, I will try and be careful with my time. There is a struggle here against the threats that come, the pressures that come from an unbelieving world, and that struggle, alongside that struggle or inherent to that struggle, is the temptation to give in, to, to buckle under the pressure. And so this first verse, this is why I think we need to be careful if we're going to understand the rest. We need to be careful here. It's not so much a, an encouragement. In your struggle, that's how I think we tend to read it, right? Well, in your struggle against sin, you know, you haven't shed your blood. And we comfort ourselves that way. I talk with people all the time who are hurting in whatever way, and they'll go, ah, yeah, this is painful and hard, but you know, I was thinking and praying for so-and-so the other day. What they're experiencing is so much worse than I am. I am experiencing. And I think there is some, some wisdom in that. There is some genuine help there. But that's not, the kind, that's not real comfort, is it? That doesn't eliminate the pain or make sense of the pain in your moment. And that's not what the writer here, I'm convinced it's not what he's saying. It's not encouragement. It's a warning he's giving. Brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who are ready to give up and go back to Judaism or whatever it is you want to go back to, you haven't even suffered to the shedding of your blood. It's going to get worse. It's going to get harder. It's going to be more painful. You young believers who are waiting for the day as you grow in your faith and faithfulness to Jesus for the Christian life to get easier. Talk to the old Christians sitting around you. In every way, this wonderful plan that God has for our life gets increasingly difficult. I, I believe that's the warning in this verse 4. You haven't even come close to the worst that Christians will suffer in this life. Secondly, remember, and this is at the heart of the passage now, remember God's word of encouragement in verses 5 to 8. The writer here puts persecution, that opposition and threat, in the category of discipline. Now, discipline here is not only or even primarily um, punishment for wrongdoing, right? We're meeting on Sunday afternoons, we were talking about, a lot about discipline last week, um, which was, was really very, a lot of fun, um, I think in a healthy way. Uh, how do we discipline our children? So we're talking about when they misbehave, we discipline them. Discipline here isn't, it, it, it can include that, but that's not the full definition of discipline. He's talking about how it is God, the Word is meant to bring up the idea of training, growing up. And he's putting persecution, and we can put other hardships, other tragedies, other trials into the same package. These are the tools, the strange tools in God's parenting toolbox with his children. He disciplines. Well, what is the word of encouragement here? The writer reaches back to Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. What is the encouragement? Well, son, don't worry about hardships because God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life, so life's going to be easy. That's not the word of encouragement. If you're listening or watching anything that even gets close to tying the gospel and God's love to that kind of thought, turn it off. Run from it. The encouragement here is to receive discipline from God with both hands and a full heart. He says first, don't dismiss it. Don't fail to benefit from it. Don't look past it. Don't avoid it. And secondly, he says, don't be discouraged by it. Don't become frustrated and bitter as God brings things into your life which you wish were not there, and yet he has ordained for your spiritual good. If you, if you are not alert, bitterness will grow. Frustration, anger. He's saying, son, now, and picture, so the proverb is from Solomon, King Solomon, to King Solomon's son, who's the heir to the throne, right? That's the picture from Proverbs. And, and so the principle is Solomon, 
is saying to his son, don't make light of God's discipline in your life. Don't miss the opportunities that God gives for your growth and improvement under his discipline. That's the word of encouragement. And don't miss it. God disciplines or trains up those he loves. And God chastens, the word there could be, it may be in the ESV, scourge. It, it, to flog, to, to whip, to shred someone's back with a painful implement. God chastens, he scourges those who are his sons. Again, don't get caught up in, well, the girls aren't. What happens to all the ladies? The picture is not so much, and I hate to even use the word gender in any conversation these days, but it's not so much gender-driven as it is status-driven. The son is the heir to the king's throne. So Proverbs is Solomon to his son. And he's saying, all of us as God's redeemed people, we all have the status of sonship, that kind of privileged place in our relationship with God. And so God... He is invested in the spiritual growth of those he loves. He is invested in those who are his children. And that means he brings hard things because those are the best tools to grow us up into the image of our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on to expound this, to press it home. He's saying really the same things. He's just pressing them further. In the NIV, verse 7 says, Endure hardship as discipline. It really, hardship is not there in the original Greek language. It's just endure discipline. Now, it's understood. It's not a bad translation. That the discipline is hard. (laughs) That the discipline is painful. In fact, he's going to go on to describe it in that way. But he's calling us, this really stands at the center of the whole passage, to stand our ground in faith and to stay the course in faithfulness in the midst of the discipline that God brings into our lives. Don't be thrown off by it, but grow. He compares this reality, God's discipline in our lives as His redeemed children, to earthly fathers who disciplined their sons for a while as best they could. God disciplines perfectly. He is going to discipline us precisely because He's a good Father, and that's what good fathers do. So, here's the encouragement. Whatever the hard thing is in your life today, or hard things, these are gifts from your Heavenly Father who loves you and wants you to experience His holiness and peace. Now, there's one last thought here that helps, at least helps us make sense of (laughs) hardships that we can't really find good answers to. Why? Listen, the last thing is this in verses 9 to 11. Rest in God's perfect application and good purpose in discipline. Well, that's a long heading. Rest in God's perfect application and good purpose in His discipline. Human fathers, as I said, he points to human fathers, even the good ones, they do their best because they love their kids and they want them to grow up and to be healthy, whole people and to live healthy, productive lives in this world. But even the best of fathers get it wrong. That's part of the fun on Sunday afternoons. It's having to acknowledge none of us None of us bat a thousand in this thing in raising our children. We've all got some pretty both funny and sad stories to share where we've had moments of failure. Even the best of parents fail in their raising of their children in moments of discipline and hard instruction. They get it wrong. They miss things. We overreact. We make mistakes. But they disciplined us in love and for our good. And he says, in time, children grow up and are grateful for parents who love them enough to give them boundaries and to shape them and mold them with hard things. I'm grateful for that, for a dad, for a mom. They didn't always get it right, and I do have some nice, interesting stories I could tell. (laughs) 
Uh, they didn't always get it right, but we knew as children that they loved us and what they were doing, they really wanted God's best for us. Right? That's the best we can do as parents is, is hand that off to our children. Well, how much better then? So it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. How much better a father is our Father in heaven? We should submit, he says, to the discipline of our Heavenly Father precisely because He doesn't make any mistakes. That's one of the first thoughts that come to mind. Whatever the hard thing, whatever the tool of discipline might be, oftentimes our first thought is, this is a mistake. This ought not to happen. Now, in many hard things, there is sin, which is mistake isn't a big enough term. Both in me and maybe in someone else, there's sin. That must be dealt with. But God's purpose in the circumstance, well, He's going to use that. Even even where I've contributed sinfully, He will turn and use that thing for my good and for His glory. He's that kind of Father. He misses nothing. He is all wise and He is all good and He is all powerful. Rest in God's perfect application and good purpose. Because of the kind of Father He is, we can trust how He's going to use these things in our lives. And we can always trust that He has a purpose and a plan, even in the hardest of things. This is really what comes in verses 10 and 11. Let me just give those to you again. The discipline, they, earthly fathers, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. For those who have been trained by it. The focus in these verses is God's good plan and purpose through hard things. He is always working for our good. Always. Do you believe that? In this moment, the person you're thinking of, the circumstances you're thinking of, the problem you need to resolve, whatever the thing is, do you trust your Heavenly Father enough to say, Father, whatever you want to do with that, whatever you want to do with that, you do it. I know what I want you to do with that, but not my will, yours be done. God's purpose is for our good. Here it's pictured In verse 10, to share in His holiness. Verse 11, He points to righteousness and peace. Well, the discipline, we could spend some time here, I won't. I think I've touched on it enough. Discipline is painful. Just a word of instruction for parents. I'm not thinking of any particular way of disciplining children when they're bad, but if the discipline doesn't inflict some measure of pain in some way, if they don't feel hurt by the discipline, then it's probably not discipline. The pain is necessary for the growth. And so it is with us in God's hands as His children. Discipline remains painful. It's not pleasant. But it brings a harvest of holiness and righteousness and peace. You see, the results of these things, this discipline, is gloriously good. It's spiritual growth and maturity, character formation, making us like our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God disciplines us, His children, through these hard things so that we will grow up. Now, I, I need to close off here. And, and I want to be careful. Experiencing hard things, painful things, and I haven't been immune to it myself in my personal life, And the Lord has given me the privilege and blessing of being a part of this church family for long enough. Almost every face that's been here for more than a couple years, you know, we've walked together through some hard things. And some are walking now through horribly hard things that I want to reach in and I want to pull it out. I don't want that for you. Experiencing these things raises serious questions. Father in heaven, what is this? What is going on? Why is this happening? It seems so arbitrary and random. 
Am I being punished? Have I gone so far afoul that you're crushing me in this moment, in this experience, in this awful thing? What purpose, what good purpose could come from this, Father? If you've never wrestled in prayer in that way with your Heavenly Father, well, you just haven't been a Christian long enough, it will come. And you'll need the Psalms of David and otherwise. You'll need a voice. I don't know how to pray. I'm frightened and I'm angry and I'm... We don't respond. This is why the discipline is discipline. We don't respond the way we should. (laughs) He's going to grow us up. Listen, I simply want to encourage you this morning. Our only hope as we face the hard things that come in this life is the unshakable reality of our Heavenly Father's divine providential care in our lives. Our Heavenly Father's divine providential care in our lives. That's our only hope. God's superintending, purposing of all things, even the most painful events or circumstances, for our good, for our spiritual life and growth, and for His ultimate glory. So please understand something. It is only because the gospel is true that any of this makes any sense at all. If you're not a Christian, everything I've just been talking about probably sounds crazy. At best, it probably sounds like Charlie Brown's parents. And if you have understood any of the words, you're going, what kind of, I'm going to love, I'm going to bow to that kind of God who promises, you bow to me and I will bring you hard things. Uh, you're sitting there as a non-Christian going, this is crazy. Listen, it's not crazy if you understand what we celebrated around this table. Jesus' suffering was not random or arbitrary. It was for a gloriously good purpose, a God-designed purpose from eternity past. God determined that Christ Himself would become a human being. He would be born to Mary. He delivered in that manger in Bethlehem. And He would live a perfect life. And He would die in our place on that accursed tree. And He would die bearing the guilt of our sin. But He would be raised by the power of God to everlasting life. And He gives forgiveness and life to all who trust in Him. Listen, when you put the cross in the context of the glory then what I'm talking about here makes perfect sense. Seeing and understanding the suffering and the victory of Jesus opens the way to this very peculiar and wonderful peace. And it is the road to perseverance. And so, listen to these familiar words. Because the gospel is true, 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21. If you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. James 1, verses 2 to 4. You know it, don't you? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Count it all joy. Romans 8, first verse 18 and then 28. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I'm going to read that again. I, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And then verse 28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And then one final word from the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5, at the tail end of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. 
For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, brothers and sisters in Christ, God loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. 